Welcome to Trinity Place in Geneva, New York. My name is Cameron Miller, and this is a sermon <clears throat> for the sixth Sunday of Epiphany. And the readings, which I'm not going to read to you, uh, are Sirach, otherwise known as Ecclesiasticus, 15, 15 through 20. Sirach, 15, 15 through 20. And then the longer of the two, Matthew, Gospel of Matthew 5, 21 through 37, chapter 5, 21 through 37. You are most welcome to look those up if you're not watching this as part of our worship video. But doggone it! <laughs> I hate it <clears throat> when the text is so onerous and foggy that I have to spend all my time, my all my preaching time, explaining it just to get to it. But that's where we are today. Now, I love that piece from Ecclesiasticus, or Sirach, and I'm going to wander back to it after dealing with Matthew. Matthew. <laughs> First of all, remember that Matthew was a Jew, writing to Jewish Christians, and for him, those 613 laws were front and center. Unlike Mark and Luke, who were Gentiles and could work with the law more conveniently and with less emotional entanglement, Matthew stood within the tradition and honored the sacredness of the laws of Moses. But even with Matthew, it's not as cut and dried as it seems. If we stop at, reading, stop at the surface reading of Matthew, then what we hear is this. Any of us who have ever felt anger, experienced lust, engaged in adultery, got a divorce, remarried, or have taken an oath in the court of law anywhere, is condemned. Just out of hand. <laughs> Done. Finished. But there must be something else going on here because that's not the Jesus that bleeds through elsewhere in the Gospels. What I, I think Jesus is doing in each case of these tough-talking dictations on the law of Moses is digging underneath the letter of the law and searching for deeper meaning. And he did so, as he did so well, he grapples with the root purpose of the law, finding the radical, the root. It is too easy, Jesus is saying, to have a set of rules and treat them like a bundle of sticks that we either carry or break. What, what is the purpose of the rule, he asks? What are the relationships uh, that, la that, are that are intended um, to be honored and sustained within the laws. Why was the rule created in the first place? Judges and lawyers at court can argue about what the letter says. Prophets and preachers want to know what's underneath. What is the root purpose for which the law was given? Jesus is really hearkening back to Moses, which he does often in Matthew, by saying, don't just, don't just know the law. Remember why it was given. So, for example, Jesus understands that murder generally doesn't just happen unless it's premeditated. It begins with anger and hatred and resentment. In order to fulfill the law against murder, especially in a culture where he led of blood libel and blood debt, we have to manage our anger and our hatred. He's being practical and acknowledging the presence of anger within us. Manage your anger or you will not be able to live within the law. That's what he's saying. It's pretty simple, really. It's the same kind of thing when he's talking about lust or adultery or divorce. 
Managing lust like anger is the key to being able to keep the law, not to mention marriage. Just as we cannot live within just as we cannot live without feeling angry, we cannot live without feeling lust, Jesus says. So manage your lust and you'll be able to keep the law. It's not enough to say, here's the rule, live by the rules. We have to acknowledge our humanity. Yeah. We are not rule creatures. That's the whole point of the Garden of Eden story, after all. So we begin by acknowledging our lust, our anger, our gluttony, our envy, whatever the agitation is, and then we work with it, listen to it, manage it. If we do that, then living within the law is doable. But if we simply deny what we shouldn't feel, and pretend that we don't want to do things that break the rules, then those root agitations will become more powerful than our other desires or intentions. And that's when we'll stumble. That's what Jesus is saying, I think, about lust and anger. Now, adultery and divorce, I feel I have to go through this every time Jesus is teaching on divorce comes up in the lectionary. Why? Because the Christian tradition is just plain ugly. Whether it's the, it was the Pope or Henry VIII using divorce as a diplomatic and military weapon or hanging witches, we have to admit that our history is just plain ugly. I know there's plenty of beauty in it too, but we need to call our baby ugly when it cries. In Jesus' day, among first century Judeans anyway, adultery was a crime of property, a property crime, because a wife was a man's property. Unlike Roman law, and unlike most of the cultures surrounding them, a Judean woman could not divorce her husband. Only a husband could divorce. The only real argument in the law was whether there had to be a stated grounds for divorce. Now, Rabbi Shammai said that a man could only divorce his wife if she had committed adultery. Rabbi Hillel, on the other hand, taught that a man could divorce his wife for any reason, really, whether it was bad breath or lousy cooking. A man having sex with an unmarried woman was not adultery because there was no property involved. So Jesus enters into this argument in that context, and he basically says, look, marriage is not something that can be dissolved as if it never happened. Even if you get a divorce, and even if you remarry, the echoes of the former marriage stay, within, stay with both of you, and enter the new marriage with you. Divorce is not a solution to what ails you. It's as if Jesus is saying, divorce may be a necessity, and it may even be the best choice for you, but it does not fix what's broken within you. And once remarried, the old marriage does not just go away, but becomes just because the law allows it. So Jesus is not offering a straight up or down vote on divorce like the Roman Catholic Church does and some Protestant churches do and they want to pretend that it is black and white, no, yes, no, yes. Rather, it's a tacit acknowledgement that the internal and relational agitations that destroy marriage are not solved by divorce, even though divorce is allowed by the law. And there is one more thing implied by Jesus in this whole thing. Marriage is not a property law. In talking about marriage and divorce, the way that Matthew has Jesus talking about it, Jesus is actually promoting what we would call in our world the equity or the equality between men and women. 
Specifically and elsewhere, he supports his argument about marriage and divorce by citing the creation story in which it says that we were created, quote, male and female in the image of God. In other words, marriage is a relationship and marriage is the relationship that we know that it is. It's not a property transaction. Divorce is legal under the law, and he confirms that, but it doesn't deny or erase the relationship that once existed because the law allows it, he suggests, does not mean that the bond that existed never happened. Because this is what he teaches, in other places, the scribes and those with a fetish for the letter of the law try to trip him up with absurd arguments about what happens in the afterlife when all those once married people are together all in the same time and place. But Jesus refuses to massage their fetish and does not engage in such ridiculous arguments. All right, I've done my duty to tilt the windmill of ugly Christian teachings by explaining that what Matthew looks like is not what it really is. So, back to Sirach. What is this book? You may not know it. It's like the book of Proverbs. It's a catalog of proverbial wisdom laid out with a kind of lack of apparent organization. It's also not included in the Jewish canon of biblical text. For one, it was written after the so-called time of prophecy had ceased. And then at the time of Judaism, uh, in the time that Judaism was forming its canon, Sirach was also embraced by the Catholic Church. And in fact, the word Ecclesiasticus is Latin for church book. So it gave some bad mojo to, to Sirach for Judaism. Sirach points to its author, Ben Sirah, originally written in Hebrew and translated into Greek by his grandson. Scraps of the Hebrew text were found at Masada. So we know it had an early status within Judaism before the more modern rabbinic period. Anyway, all of that is neither here nor there. It's just a little history for those who are interested in wondering what Sirach is. But the bit we read today is viscerally practical wisdom. And we know it in our gut. How we live and what we do is our choice. Fire or water, we get to choose. We know this with clarity underneath our propensity for denial and excuses and self-fogging confusion we like to create at critical moments of decision. Fire and water, life and death, we get to choose. It's in the tradition of prophetic wisdom that says to us, look, God will not save you from your choices. God doesn't punish and, doesn't, and God does not want you to suffer. But God will allow you to make your choices and then you will live with the consequence of those choices. Do not pretend or fantasize or flare up magical thinking to imagine that God will clean us up for you. Make your dang choice, the voice of Ben Sira says. You know which is life and which is death. You know the difference between fire and water. Do it. <laughs> I love that voice. The prophetic wisdom that can niggle its way into our brain and clear the fog and create uh, that we and clear the fog that we create to soften our reality. Hey, climate change is real. Either you change your ways or your planet's gonna come roaring back and flatten, burn, and drown you. Yep. I think that was the message of Noah's Ark. Hey, don't try to be God and use your limited knowledge or beauty of your, or the beauty of your bodies and the joys of your experience 
or you will be tortured by unanticipated consequences. And yep, that was the message of the Garden of Eden. In our haughty postmodern sophistication, we dismiss the wisdom of ancient peoples as primitive and ignorant, when actually there is a hair of difference between them and us. Heck, the more we are learning about Neanderthals, the less difference there seems to have been between them and us. And yet, we continue to dismiss the wisdom of our ancients and find ourselves in great peril as a result. No, we cannot just take the text at its literal word. No, we cannot fetishize the letter of the law and the prophets. No, we cannot just stop with the literal teachings of Jesus. Yes, we have to contextualize them. We have to interpret them. We have to reinterpret them, but always, always take them seriously. The wisdom of the ancients in Christianity and in other religions have a voice. And we need to listen to those voices and take them seriously. It's our choice, fire and water. We get to choose. I'm glad you chose to be here and with me in this, for this day and this occasion. Peace be with you and thank you very much.